Good afternoon, everybody, or maybe good evening for those of you who aren't in the UK at the moment. Thank you so much for making time to attend this shared learning event. And it's run in conjunction with the Wales Africa Health Links Network, of which I'm a trustee, and also Hub Cymru Africa. And we'll say a little bit more uh, about the organisation in a moment. So the event is about the International Learning Opportunity Scheme that is run by the Welsh Government. And it's such a fantastic scheme. I really want people to be aware of it, as does the board of the, the network, the Wales Africa Health Links Network, because it's all about developing and evolving partnerships between Wales and key countries in Africa. So just in terms of uh, some background, my name is Karen Robson. I am a trustee of the Wales Africa Health Links Network and a little bit about that organisation. Uh, we're a charity and have been since 2013, but we set up it initially as an informal network of partnerships, uh, really the mission being the promotion, the protection of good health between Wales and Africa. And the, the focus is on healthcare. But what I would say is if there's anybody on this call who doesn't come from a healthcare background, who is interested in the ILO opportunity, please don't disappear. The focus is on healthcare, but there are many sort of transferable elements to this. And I'm sure John and Daniel on the call from Welsh Government can help us through any questions that you might have. So please, please don't despair if healthcare isn't your thing. But we think there are about 20 or so partnerships across Wales, maybe even more. And we hope that by promoting this international learning opportunity scheme, it gives people the opportunity to have an awareness about what's available. Not necessarily, you know, to plan to do it next week, but maybe to have it somewhere in uh, your planning to think, well, actually, that might be a really great opportunity for me, my organisation or an organisation in one of four countries that the Welsh Government scheme uh, supports. Uganda, Namibia, uh, Lesotho and Somaliland also is the newest. And, and uh, John can give us more information about that as we go. So we've got... Um, two really interesting speakers for you today, one of whom is still in country in Uganda. So we're hoping and praying that the technology actually um, will, will facilitate this event or maybe the technology where I am um, will, will, will let it down, but let's see. So um, this session is really about just introducing and whetting your appetite to the scheme. It's only an hour long, and that was done deliberately because we wanted to keep it tight and brief. And there will be an opportunity for further sessions if anybody is particularly interested in taking this further. So before we go any further, I would like to introduce Sue Tranker, the Chief Nursing Officer, who was very kindly uh, put together a short video for us. And this gives context to the International Learning Opportunity Scheme and why it's a Welsh Government priority and how, how it ties in with NHS priorities too. So Lena, who is from Hub Cymru Africa, who's facilitating this, I think she's going to kick it off. Thank you, Lena. Opportunities programme provides a fantastic opportunity for nurses and healthcare professionals to work in Africa for eight weeks experiencing a new way of working, developing new skills. One of my key priorities over the next two years centres around nursing and midwifery, workforce focusing on their development to ensure they achieve their full potential. And this aligns with the NHS in Wales, which is committed to ensuring that we in Wales learn from partners in countries such as Lesotho, Uganda, Namibia and Somaliland as well as sharing the skills we have gained in living and working in Wales. Wales has a charter for international health partnerships, which makes a commitment for those participating to not only access special leave through established procedures, but also recognises international partnerships as continuing professional development. I would encourage, therefore, anyone with an interest in expanding their knowledge and global connections in the pursuit of improving health to apply for this program. Thank you, Lena, that, that's great. And I hope that just gives you just a little bit of a context, but also I think to hear from the CNO demonstrates the, the level of support 
that is in place for this scheme. Um, we'll probably hear that it's not without its challenges. And I think she mentioned special leave and, and, and a couple of other things. And that's where I'm hoping that we can sort of get a discussion going on how we can smooth the way for colleagues who are interested in this. So you've heard a little about the scheme and how it connects with priorities in Wales. And we're really keen to encourage people with a healthcare background in its broadest sense to apply to the programme this year, maybe next year. Um, so we've got two speakers. I'm going to introduce the first person now, and I'm going to bring in Zora Amar, who is currently in Uganda. Um, and she is a, a lead clinical research nurse, um, normally works at Prince Philip Hospital, but is currently at Mabali Regional Referral Hospital. So Zara, over to you. If you could give us a little bit about your background, why you decided to apply, what you've got out of it, and I'm sure maybe a hint of some of the challenges that you've experienced, because we need to be real about this process as well. Hi, hello, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, perfect, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully my internet will stay on board. There's a bit of a storm going on outside. Touch wood, it's been okay so far, and it's pretty good in the accommodation where I am. So um, I'm volunteering at the Bali Regional Referral Hospital. Uh, my background is, so I am a lead research nurse in Howell but my background prior to that, I was a theatre nurse. Um, and I decided to apply for the ILA um, programme because I've always wanted to do voluntary work abroad, but I've just never got around to organising it or looking into it. And then um, a global email came around and it was a session just like this one with a couple of healthcare professionals talking um, about their experience experiences and sort of how to go about applying for the scheme. Um, I also wanted to have a bit of a challenge, so working in a different country and also working in a different healthcare sort of system and seeing what that was like and hopefully that by sharing any knowledge and skills I had would be of a benefit but also gaining sort of knowledge and skills of working with the teams out here, how they deal with sort of their challenges, are their challenges very different from ours, or do they have the same challenges? Um, so I was just interested to find out about that and also being able to um, come out to a country, experience the culture, be here for eight weeks, you get a bit of a different experience than if you just came on holiday here. So after I um, came to the webinar, I think it was last year, last year around June time, it must've been, um, I approached my manager and said that I'd seen this and I'd like to apply and would she support me in that? And luckily I have a very good manager <laughs> who was um, extremely supportive, um, um, encouraged me to apply. She, I sent her all the information that I'd received from um, John and Lena and the team uh, so she could see what sort of the placement benefits I would get, but also hopefully coming back to the organisation there'd be benefits as well. Um, and she, so she wrote a letter of support for me when I applied. Um, also, I think it's been good for my local team. So they're more aware of the scheme. But also, while I've been away, somebody has been able to step into my shoes and take on a leading role that they probably wouldn't have done if I'd have been there. So they've had that experience for two months, as well as me being over here. So it's been good on both fronts um, there. And we've got a few team members that I think would like to um, apply going forward so I've encouraged them to apply from what I've had out here so what have I got out of the scheme um, coming out I really didn't know what to expect um, I was um, put in touch with uh, Dr Adam Hewitt Smith who is an anaesthetic and critical care lead in the hospital um, and so he does quite a bit of research out here they've just won quite a big um, grant with the NHR um, to do research out in Uganda um, and so he was setting up a, a small team within his um, group of staff to have a research team working there setting up their research and also running um, hosted research studies so um, I was able to work with them and I am still working with them on sort of setting up policies for uh, within their little unit that they're setting up. Um, unfortunately, I haven't got any studies currently running, so I didn't help with those. 
but there's an opportunity for people coming out in the future that you know there is there's research going on out here um, they're encouraging all the local Ugandan doctors to get involved in that and lead on studies um, so as well as doing that I was also linked in with the operating theatres so I've had a chance to be able to witness how the theatres run over here um, and I did a bit of an audit with them and looked at their processes and unfortunately eight weeks is such a short time it goes really really quickly um, so what we've done is I fed back on the audit that I've done to the theatre sister and we've got in touch with an organisation called Lifebox and hopefully they're going to come and run the programme, which is a six month programme looking at reducing surgical site infections. So that's been really good that we've linked in and hopefully they're going to be back in touch in April to organise when they can come out. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be around for that, but we set the groundwork and they're looking at specific um, six sort of areas within theatres that can help reduce surgical site infections. So it's been really great to collaborate and get connections in that area and also with the research team. And a lot of the research work, um, they use emails. So hopefully when I come back to the UK, I'll still have that connection. I'll still be able to collaborate with them and offer any help that I can and hopefully maybe link in with some studies in the future. Um, unfortunately, the theatre team don't really use emails at all. It's just not something that is a standard um, sort of thing for the staff out here. Um, so they do use WhatsApp, which is great. So I can still keep in touch with them via the WhatsApp um, and hopefully see how they're getting on with the Clean Cut programme. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a, a challenge. Also, obviously I've been able to see the country. So on the weekends off, I've been traveling around, having a look at the country um, and been able to see some of the other projects that are being run here outside of healthcare. Um, so there's some projects with planting trees, coffee, um, there was one recently with the Red Cross out here doing some first aid and some sort of children's charities as well, which has been great to see the other projects that are running um, alongside and they all do sort of interconnect with the healthcare as well. Um, like Karen said earlier, if you're not in healthcare or you don't think it's um, for you, I would say it definitely is. Um, there's so many areas within um, the hospital itself that they could really do with, um, you know, help. So from cleaners just coming in and giving like advice on what sort of things would be running to porters, to estate people, anybody within the infrastructure would be really, really helpful. From a sort of nursing or a doctor background, um, physios, ITU staff, they've got a small um, surgical high dependency unit here. Um, recovery staff, they're just the areas that I've seen while I've been here. There's a huge amount of um, sort of midwifery um, input that could be um, available to somebody. They do a huge amount of um, births here and sort of all the issues surrounding that. Um, so yeah, I would just say apply if you can. If you've got an interest, definitely apply. Um, whatever sort of knowledge and skills you're bringing, you will be able to input somewhere along the line and also I think you'll get a lot back from it as well. Um, some areas are quite challenging so as a nurse I'm normally used to getting involved in do, doing stuff but I'm a volunteer out here so there's a limit to what I can do um, and sometimes when you're seeing things that you know could be done better it's just being able to um, convey that in sort of a a positive proactive way there's a lot of challenges they face out here with resources um, staffing levels um, and so they do a great job with what they've got but there's plenty of area for improvement and it's just finding sustainable ways that will fit into the system that will be able to help improve um, their sort of the systems and how they do things here um, so yeah that's in a nutshell <laughs> my eight weeks and I'm this is my eighth week now so I've got a few more days before I fly back home um like I say eight weeks has gone so quickly um and I'll definitely be coming back if not to work then definitely for a holiday it's an absolutely stunning country so yeah if you don't come out to work or on volunteering come out for a holiday here <laughs> support their uh, infrastructure and their tourism you won't regret it
Thank you, Zora. That was really interesting. I think I, I took a couple of things away from, from that. But one of them was how there is really a role for anybody with any kind of background. And I, I think, you know, invariably, we are looking at clinicians and practitioners. That, that's kind of obvious in terms of the, the, the transferable skills. But actually, you're talking about cleaners and porters and, and the importance of hygiene and communication and logistics and, and all those sorts of things. Yeah. And it kind of really shows that if we can get the message out about this scheme and we support people with the application process, because some will find it no doubt easier than others, that there is maybe scope for lots of interaction and lots of partnerships. So I, I really take heart from that. I've got some questions, but what I think rather than duplicating, I'm going to bring Amanda in and get her to give her her give us her experience and her observations. And then maybe you could take the questions as a panel that might be more effective. Is that okay? So Amanda, um, I'm gonna bring in Amanda Daniel, who um, she has actually done a presentation, which is brilliant. We're gonna have Lena um, pull it up in a second, but poor Amanda's only been back in the country um, for a, a day or so. She is literally hot out of, <laughs> So, cold, I think. <laughs> or yeah, or cold, depending on, on how you, you look at it. So um, Amanda's got a background in tropical nursing and public health. She's had a lot of experience elsewhere, but she's going to just talk to us a little bit about the experience that she has very recently had. And, um, and yeah, over to you, Amanda. And, and Lena, if we could pull up the slides as well, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, pull up the slide so no one has to look at my face. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Karen, Lena, for organising this. And I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank Welsh Government, uh, John and Daniel and the Hub, um, Hub Cymru Africa team for giving me this opportunity uh, to, to go to Uganda. So I'm a bit discombobulated. I like to use that word. Uh, so So bear with me. But... I'm just going to share uh, my experience of working in Kumi and I just returned yesterday. Um, so I was matched to an organisation called Teams for You. I've put the link there also to their website. But basically, they've got a very successful uh, WASH programme. So that's water and sanita sanitary health. And um, I've got an interest in reducing healthcare associated infection and uh, antimicrobial prescribing. So that's prudent use of uh, particularly antibiotics. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Lena. So, so just to outline the, the session, I'll just talk to you very briefly about why I applied how I did it, uh, what I got out of it, which hopefully you'll you'll see through the pictures. So these are all my own pictures and Zora will know Carmel, uh, the camel, uh, who was trying on my hat there, uh, otherwise she might get the hump. That, that's a joke by the way, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't always, doesn't always work. I did tell you I'm a bit jet lagged uh, and, and just really like why you should apply uh, and really just to echo really what Zora said and, and Sue Tranka. So next slide, please. Um, so uh, what happened was after the matching, I had two virtual meetings with Teams for You. So that was the founder, uh, Dave Cook and uh, Joshua, who are part of the team in, in Wrexham and also the, the team in Uganda. So I, I made some proposals that was also with John and Daniel. Uh, so during these meetings, we just uh, talked about what kind of projects I could do. I also looked at what kind of infection rates uh, that they had in uh, in Uganda. Um, Dave uh, was planning to go in January. So I'd have gained have to thank uh, Daniel and John for getting me out so quickly after 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 the, the matching was done in December. Uh, so this was the second day, as you can see I've already got a beer in my hand um, and we had this dinner which uh, I was then introduced to all the leads from the healthcare facilities and the district health team so it was great to see everybody and to have that validation uh, because um, Teams for You have such a great uh, reputation because of uh, if you can imagine hospitals and healthcare facilities having running water that makes a huge difference to both their patients and to the staff um, so you will all be very familiar 
familiar with this improvement models, but basically I found it quite useful to try and plan what I was going to do uh, during the eight weeks. So the first couple of weeks were spent just really assessing the healthcare facilities in collaboration, of course, and looking at what their challenges were, which Zora's already referred to. Um, one of my ideas was to do a prescribing point prevalence study, um, which I'll talk about very briefly, but that was one of the main activities uh, what, during, during the time I was there. And then just from week four onwards was to really use that uh, data to, to um, give feedback to the hospital and also to the lower healthcare facilities and then see what gaps there were and you know how we could make improvements and then reevaluate. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, as I said, it's all about collaboration, isn't it? And uh, developing your own skills as well. So I hadn't done a prescribing point prevalence study before and suddenly I was in country doing it. Uh, so uh, the main picture is uh, us together. This was the IPNC committee. Um, it, uh, it, in, it was supposed to start at probably nine, nine o'clock. This is sort of 10. And by 10.30, there was a room full of people. Uh, so things do sort of uh, happen at a, a different pace, uh, which can be a bit of a challenge, but um, uh, generally get there in the end. So this was us working together. They did have an IPC committee, which is part of the reason why uh, I chose to do this. And also they had inpatients. So that's us discussing this uh, prescribing point prevalence. And they're very receptive, very on board, very knowledgeable. Uh, so I connected with the global point prevalence survey uh, to make things slightly easier, but we were registered. So that meant that any interventions we did, uh, we then had the chance to follow them up or the hospital did uh, to see where there were improvements. So the second picture is some of the wonderful nurses I worked with um, who we spent six hours on the maternity ward just to collect the data. Um, that again is quite a challenge challenge uh, a bit around documentation um, but anyway we managed to do a subset of the hospital so a point prevalence study as you probably know is a snapshot it just gives you some idea of the prescribing so it looks at where you could decide uh, you could design quality improvements uh, next slide please uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the results, but they were very interesting. So just on the left hand side, uh, the report compares our prescribing rates on the adult medical ward to the equivalents and different subregions of the global PPS. So as you can see, we have highlighted in red uh, the overall prescribing prescribing rate of antimicrobials was over 70%. That's a very high rate, but it's comparable with the prescribing rates in Uganda at 84.7%. But if you have a brief look upwards, you can see we're, we're like triple the rest of the, the rest of the universe. Um, so that was the main things was we really need to get the rates down because of resistance is going to cause a real problem. One of the major, major issues in the, the um, rural areas is there's no lab. Uh, so there's no culture and sensitivity, unfortunately. Um, so lots of presentations and the, the picture next door is a, is a video, but we won't show it. But you do get such a great response for anything you do. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, clapping that's involved singing and, and various uh, things that people do with their hands, like giving you roses. It's, it's quite spectacular. I've never had that <laughs> in my current workplace. So, you know, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very valuable. The next slide, please. Uh, just very briefly, some of the other bits of work, and, and Zora will, will be able to echo this. So um, doing some of the walk rounds in various hospitals, you can see some of the issues. But again, it's collaboration. I worked with the focal people. Uh, so we did these walk rounds and, and sort of helped uh, people to maybe understand how their workflows could be better. And this is the, the problems that they have uh, around resources and um, being able to get rid of waste. Uh, and being able to repurpose and reprocess equipment. So lo lots and lots of information there, but uh, it was very valuable. Next, next slide, please, Lena. Uh, I was very sort of reluctant to do anything around hand hygiene because for most of you that will know about change behavior is that you can't, it's very difficult to change when you don't have opportunity. So you might have running water, but you've got no soap, but this was at their request. So we did some fun things uh, using the uh, glitter, glitter gel and using UV light to show transmission of uh, microorganisms. Uh, so it was a whole room packed with the students and doctors. It was uh, uh, you know, very impactful because uh, it's such a visual thing. Uh, next slide, please. 
So why should you go? Um, hopefully, if it, uh, you, you can already see what a valuable thing it is. So Kumi is quite rural. However, we've got lots in common. So a night out in Kumi could be getting some chips. We all have chips, some hot sauce and uh, getting a nice cold beer. None of which I did, but it's available. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. And then what else do you do at the end of the night? Next slide. You, you phone a friend. I'm not sure if you can see that. Um, but this is not uncommon to see this around, around Kumi. So I would um, I, I get you to look at the very last um, option that Mama Bees could provide. And, may, and maybe that's there may be people that you knew, you know, who would benefit. Uh, next, next slide, please. So why should you do it? And sorry to use these terrible fizzy brand um Pop, popular drinks but it is such a different experience and, and it is quite challenging uh, but if you love what you do and you're passionate about it it's a great opportunity to develop your own skills and you know work collaboratively with people um, next slide please and in addition you'll make lots of friends and you'll probably possibly get baptized with a with a Ugandan name um, so you make friends that you probably will keep in touch with for, for a long time. Uh, and just next slide, please, Lena. So don't bury your head in the hedge. <laughs> and I'll leave you with this quote. And nothing is more expensive that, than a missed opportunity. So I think that's um, a valuable, a valuable quote to end on. Um, I just got one more slide. Um, and that's to say in Eteso language, which is the region of Kumi is Eliyama Noi Noi, which is thank you very much. So thanks for listening. Happy if you want to contact me, if you do go out to Uganda. Um, and just to say that uh, having talked to the staff, both at, uh, within Kumi District, again, how any kind of healthcare professionals, uh, they particularly like, uh, want to develop their own capability and capacity around research, um, but pharmacists, nurses, midwives, um, laboratory staff, anything, and, and Teams for You are really open. So if you have an idea or a project, uh, they're very open to discussing that. And just one other thing is I'm hoping to do, um, to give some support to, to Doll and Cymru as well. And I know they're uh, developing programs about, around mental health. So that's my experience of a couple of organisations um, that I'm you know, that I'm hoping to, to sort of uh, support voluntarily. So thank you very much. And thanks, Karen. Back to you. Thank you, Amanda. That was really interesting. There are sort of a number of takeaways there for me. But um, I think I'm, I think what I'd like to do is bring John in so he can talk about the scheme as it is. And then I'm going to open it up to questions as a, a panel, if that's OK, John. Just, you know, you've, you've got a flavour of the experience now by listening to Zora and Amanda. Um, but I think it might just be helpful to understand the context of what John is uh, managing. So, John, could you give us an overview of if people are interested in taking their skills into one of the four countries I mentioned at the beginning, Uganda, Namibia, Lesotho and Somaliland, um, and also they're really interested to learn from, from what they see and bring that back to their own working practice, what do they do? Where do they go? How do they kick this whole thing off? Thanks, Karen. Uh, well, yes, it's my very great pleasure to uh, to run the Wales and Africa programme. And, and what a fantastic advert for uh, our ILO programme that Zora and Amanda uh, really are. They're, you can really feel the, the enthusiasm and it's uh, the pleasure for Dan and I to work with, with people like this. Just quickly, the Wales and Africa program at the Welsh Government uh, provides small grants for organisations uh, in an attempt to encourage more people to do more of a better quality for international development, to become active global citizenship. And the ILO program really is a, a good example of active uh, global citizenship, I think. So to answer your question, uh, Karen, uh, if people are interested, they simply need to look um, at the volunteering pages on the Hub Cymru Africa website or on the Wales and Africa uh, pages on the Welsh Government uh, website. Oh, thank you, Dan, he's put up a link. Um, and uh, email us uh, and we will send you out a full information pack. If you like what you see, then 
all you have to do to apply is to send a letter of application uh, along with your CV and uh, a letter or email from your line manager saying that they're willing to support your, uh, your, your placement. Uh, we run a, a rolling program of placements. We, uh, we close every quarter. Um, so we, we're, we're due to close quite soon now, but then it immediately open up again. And we like to have a cohort of applicants so that the next stage after shortlisting, uh, when we invite you to uh, an assessment day, there will be a, a, a decent sized group of people who can interact uh, and take part in the exercises then. We then have a short interview afterwards. And uh, after that, if you're successful, uh, comes the matching where we uh, try and match the, the skills that or, or qualifications that you have with uh, placements that our partners uh, have uh, available. And if you've got particular uh, expertise, then uh, we can go out and search for a partner that, that wants what, what you've got. After that, uh, there's, uh, there's some training made available. We introduce you to the partners so that you can understand a little bit about their needs and they can understand what you've got to offer. And uh, we then make the travel arrangements uh, and uh, agree a, a mutual, mutually convenient date for you to travel. That generally, the whole process generally takes three months sometimes slightly longer. With Amanda, we, we pulled it off in just about a month with Christmas in between. So we, we are, we like to think that we're, you know, running a, a flexible program designed to give maximum support to our partners uh, whilst giving a genuine learning opportunity to participants. Uh, we don't pay uh, salary costs, but we cover uh, flights, uh, all travel, accommodation and transport uh, and your uh, jabs, etc. And we provide a comprehensive uh, health insurance uh, and we like to cover off most things. And we have a, an in-country fixer uh, who can come to the rescue in terms of need, should there be any, which I'm sure there won't be. But uh, there we are. That's a quick overview of how you do it. It couldn't really be more straightforward to apply. What on earth are you waiting for? John, thank you for that. that that's just, this is just the baseline at the moment. And as somebody who did five summers in Rwanda on a variety of different sorts of programmes, not through the ILO, through something different, but nonetheless, I can also vouch what a life-changing experience it was and how... I was able to bring some of that learning back into my own practice and hopefully left a little bit there as well. So I really, really thoroughly recommend the opportunity that's presented to you. I think, you know, we also need to address some, some of the maybe difficulties here. Um, when you registered, um, I asked for two documents to be shared with you. One was just the international learning opportunities um, information about the process and the matching and things like that. The other was the International Health Care Charter. And that's relevant because within that charter, as I understand it, all the health boards in Wales signed up to that charter and that grants um, the opportunity for special leave. Now we know on the grapevine that sometimes it is difficult for people to get special leave. It sounded like Amanda and Zora you know, you had a, a fairly straightforward process when they, they did this. Um, but colleagues of mine on the Wells and Africa Health Links Network, all from a medical uh, clinical background, potentially they would be able to help with applications if people found that they were maybe finding that their application wasn't wholly well received. You know, we know about the difficulties in staffing in our own NHS. We know about this, the pressures of work. But nonetheless, I think it's about presenting the opportunity in a way that the organisation you're coming from can see what benefit it is to them. And, and I think Zora also said about when she was there, where it gave the opportunity for somebody slightly more junior than her to step up for that period of time. And that's a really good opportunity in house. So um, there's just a couple of observations. While we've been talking, I've noticed the chat bar has been active. Um, and the first question that I, I saw that I think might be for John is uh, from, let's see, is there a minimum qualification level, i.e. junior doctor, middle grade consultant? 
John. Hello, here I am. Um, no. Uh, medical professionals have a particular issue, uh, obviously, where uh, they might find themselves in a position where they're asked to do something beyond their level of qualification or competency. And that can have uh, an impact on your, your standing here. So that's something that uh, medical professionals in particular have to be careful of. But actually, um, no, we, we send a lot of people. In fact, most of the people that we send are not uh, medically qualified at all. So uh, it's, it's, we look at the person in the round, what uh, skills and life experience have you got that could be of assistance to our partners? If you're a very well organized office manager, for instance, there's always openings for uh, to helping small NGOs get their act together. Uh, there's a, a huge variety of placements. OK, thanks for that, John. And this is an interesting one, actually. Um, this is from somebody called Grace. I'm a community pharmacist currently working in a local authority public health role, health protection in England, but looking to come back to Wales. Would I be able to apply? Well, Grace, thank you so much for your question. Um, the Welsh Government's funding, uh, meagre as it is from the UK Government, is for the benefit of the people of Wales. So uh, as soon as you have come back to Wales, Grace, you'd be uh, exceptionally welcome to apply. But you do have to be either living or working in Wales. OK. Um, and also, um, are there any pre-hospital emergency opportunities and then there's an extra word added care uh pre-hospital emergency opportunities i would have thought so john i don't know what pre-hospital emergency opportunity is but i'm going to stick my neck out and say yes <laughs> uh, if, uh, <laughs> if is, is that is that uh ambulance services it's not specified. Can, can aid, sort of, we, we've sent people with the Red Cross. We've had a number of very successful placements with first aid training. In fact, someone who just came back at the weekend was doing first aid training. Uh, ambulance staff, yes. Yes, in particular. And in fact, we have funded, and in the Mbali region of Uganda, uh, there is a, a motorcycle ambulance service that was set up with support from people of Wales. So um yes okay um so from katie do you know how much scope there would be to apply for this taking time out whilst in a training role well that's not really one that i can answer that's that's between you and your employer and perhaps the wales and africa health links network could uh be of assistance there as I said, you know, if you're training to be something, then you can't go out and do that role. Uh, so, right, it's it's difficult. And opening the floodgates to people that are in training uh, can. This is a small program. Yeah. Um, so this next question is about um, the deadline. Um, the deadline for the next intake is fast approaching. Also, you mentioned that the process takes around three months. Is that three months from your application being accepted or from maybe the point of application? So I think you've spoken before about it being a rolling application process, John. Yes. So um, we have a cutoff point at the end of this month. It's quarterly. Uh, so it seemed to make sense. It's, this is the end of the first quarter of the calendar year. Uh, but we will be opening it immediately afterwards. Um, it generally takes people three months to get their act together. Once once we've said, OK, yes, you can go for eight weeks, they have to get their life in order and get someone to look after their dog or get someone to cover their time at work or, or just make the plans, really. So if you're going to Uganda, for instance, you have to have a yellow fever. You might have, if you've not been to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa before, you might have to have a whole load of injections. Um, so, you know, it can take a while to sort. But, you know, as I say, we, we sorted Amanda's placement out quite quickly. So we wouldn't want to keep people hanging around. Very much depends on how many um, people we have in the pool at any one time. 
And I, I guess that there's a sort of a, a combination between how quickly you can turn things around, how quickly the applicant can get their life into order, but also how the workplace is able to provide sort of provision for that person going AWOL for a couple of uh, months. Well, exactly. Yes. I mean, it's very common for employers to say, oh, yes, you can go for eight weeks, but not those eight weeks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely. And um, this is an interesting one. And I think I know the answer to this because I think this came up in our June session. But um, I'm an international student studying in Wales, taking a master's in public health, though I have a background in pharmacy. Is there any possibility that an application from an international student might be considered? Yeah, if you're studying in Wales, you count. You're Welsh. You're in. <laughs> um, Right. OK. Um, again, I think we, we've covered this one previously, but for the benefit of this audience, John, would you consider setting up in other countries? We're trying to set up a link between Bangor and somewhere in Sierra Leone. Would you be able to offer us any support? Well, you'd be welcome to uh, apply for one of the small grants that I that I mentioned. Uh, there's an even tighter deadline uh, for the current round of that, which is the 24th of this month. Um, the ILO program is, you know, difficult to set up elsewhere. We are considering setting it up in Somaliland at the moment, for instance. Um, we have an in-country manager uh, in Namibia, uh, Lesotho and Uganda. Uh, and we like to be able to send people where we know that we can offer good quality assistance to them uh, when things go wrong. Uh, there may be some other means of supporting your your link, uh, and I could see the, the Wales and Africa Health Links Network exists to uh, to support such links outside of the ILO program. Yeah, absolutely. On that, I, I can't categorically hand on heart say that we we can pull this off, but I've got a lot of colleagues on the board with me with a whole variety of, of knowledge and experience. I know that um, Paul. Myers is, is on this call, or at least he was when we first logged on, um, and he's got a lot of experience with an organisation, I think it's called Don and Cymru, and even just in terms of setting up the support, the parameters of support, the terms of reference, all that kind of very basic governance stuff, these might be things that we can help you with. So um, if you haven't got my contact details, maybe go through Lena and she can pass the message on to us and we can see if we can get some assistance for you. Um, so those were questions very much about the application process. And as I say, you were furnished with some information about the um, ILO programme and also the International Health Charter, which I think is quite useful information. But, you know, while we've got the privilege of having Zora and Amanda on the call, have we got any questions about their in-country experience, the reality, you know, we're obviously encouraging people to go and to take up this amazing opportunity, but I, I also believe people need to go into it with their eyes open. Um, and I think, you know, one of Amanda's slides there in terms of a sign that she'd seen, you know, uh, was it Mama, Mama Beers or something, you know, the, the, the cultural differences maybe that will apply. I mean, Amanda, would you like to say something a bit about that? Because I think was quite interesting um I, I think the main thing for me it, it was a couple of things actually like Kumi's quite rural uh so you know if you want uh places to have coffee and um go to nice restaurants that that isn't the case uh so I suppose you just need to uh be able to entertain yourself be quite comfortable uh with with, uh, with your own company not saying I am but um at Teams for You the accommodation is really nice um and so fortunately, there, there, there is a chef there. I mean, I did use the kitchen and introduce them to pizza making and uh, peanut butter and chocolate cookies. I think they enjoyed that. And the other thing to say is it's very deeply Christian. Um, so often it, you um, you would uh, everything you do really is preceded by prayers and then uh, um, uh, opening remarks, et cetera, et cetera. So and, of, and there's lots of different uh, languages. So a Tesso is spoken in Kumi but you can't use that in Mbale. So, and often people, you know, will, will talk in their local language. Uh, so I think it's just, you don't always understand what's going on. 
Um, but people, uh, you know, for example, if they promise to meet you at a certain time, they won't show up for about an hour. Uh, but it, it's it's not done in a malicious way. It's really they they know they've got so many other things to deal with. They'll try and make it, but the chances are they won't, and you won't get an apology. And uh, but it's all okay <laughs> as long as you're as long as you've got a positive attitude and you're quite chilled and you're not too uptight about time. I mean, it, you know, you, you obviously want people to be there on time, and it's a good practice, but it, it does it doesn't always work that way but you don't need to be despondent because it always works out if i could just add uh, uh, onto that point i mean we do have uh, three very different countries that we're sending people to uh, so you know we, we try and tease out from uh, applicants what it is they're looking for how adventurous they are amanda is the first person to go to uh, kumi which is some miles north of Mbali, where we normally send people um, so, you know, if, if you can't have a yellow fever jab, for instance, we can send you to uh, Lesotho or, you know, if you if you must have a Nando's every Friday, we can send you to uh, Namibia. You know, they've got pavements and streetlights and everything and a Nando's. Uh, it's three very different countries, as I say. So we can try and match your appetite for adventure. Uh, with um, yeah, and religion too is another thing. You know, it, it does differ from place to place. Um, there's just another question that uh, from Ian Hatt. Does the program ask for a report following deployment? If so, are those reports available for prospective applicants to read? I suppose to help them with the uh, induction process. John. Well, thanks for that, Ian. Yeah, well, we do. Um, we we have several different ways of debriefing people afterwards. And yes, we are expecting uh, written reports, I guess. Uh, and we, we have produced some materials um, for prospective applicants. So uh, I can see there might be reasons why people wouldn't want their reports shared. But the short answer is yes. OK. Um, anything else in terms of I'm thinking, you know, John is is generally available uh, and his colleague Daniel. But while we've got Zora and Amanda with us, um, particularly with their really recent experience, is there anything that anybody would like to ask about maybe how they prepared to go, how they got settled into their new environment, maybe some of the distinct challenges. Amanda was talking about, you know, behavioural change and whether it was appropriate to use the UV lamp or, or not, as the case may be, but she was asked to do it, so fine. Um, anything from anybody about the, the, the experience that our colleagues have got? Oh, I think maybe it's been a long day perhaps but I mean Zora in terms of your experience of settling into the environment when you got there how did you find it? I've traveled quite a bit um, previously not to actually volunteer anywhere um, but you get met at the airport um, like John was saying you've got a fixer here who is just over the road from where I'm staying in the accommodation. So any issues or problems, you can always contact them via phone. Um, I've walked back and forth from where I'm staying to the hospital and I haven't had any trouble or any problems at all. Um, it is quite um, a religious country and you will get invited to go to church. Uh, I'm not religious and I've declined. And most of the time, they're just curious to find out why, but they're absolutely fine with it. Uh, they're not opposed to having a conversation about it. Uh, one of Megan, who was here before, um, she's gone home now. She went to one of the church ones, but didn't realise it was a special event and was there for six hours. <laughs> so, yeah, I've managed to avoid it for now. Um, but the, the um, Baptist church across the road is where um, Apollo is. And if I did want to go, I'm sure it'd be absolutely fine. And then if I wanted to sneak out, hopefully I'd be able to sneak out and come back. Um, but yeah, in country, I, I haven't experienced any problems. We've got a great driver that um, we can use that will take us out of an evening so that we get to places safely and get back to our accommodation. Um, and then we've also gone out on trips on weekends um, so yeah, I have to say the whole thing's been great from sort of start to finish. 
got a six hour church service um yeah. gosh that that's one that you really have to go to your lungs for isn't it I don't, don't mind an hour but six gosh um so there was a question that popped up and I think this is relevant actually because I think many of us on this call are probably already bought into the benefits that this kind of experience brings but how do we demonstrate the value of that when we go back into our day jobs and and also how do you take some of that learning back so you know you know what are you thinking of doing Amanda you're now back how are you going to sort of convey your experience your learning you know the benefits of the NHS releasing you on what some people could perceive as a jolly I'm sure it's not but I bet some people imagine you sitting in bars at length but <laughs> if only uh well, no I've got so uh got quite a few few ideas around um how to take the learning and um attend some conferences that we have a infection prevention society so there's a a big conference uh, later on in the year so we'd hope to uh, put an abstract in there and possibly other places uh, which would also advertise uh, the ILO uh, and um, draw attention to to some of the work that's some of the good work that's been done in country as well so I'm working in public health. I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, for colleagues. So I'll be doing something internally within our organisation. Um, and I also lecture uh, at the London School for Nurses on the Diploma in Tropical Nursing. So um, have lots of links there. So uh, that's how I'll be conveying some of the learning. Uh, so part of the lecturing is about how to um, how to use infection prevention control measures when you're in a low-income country so it's, it's kind of a very useful uh, lecture so that's where I'll be sort of disseminating some of the knowledge. And, and, and one of the questions that's just popped up how did you go about designing and developing your projects you know did they come out of your head or were, were there something that you know John was already aware of you know we're looking for somebody who can work on this particular issue? Um, I I've worked overseas before um, in Sierra Leone, Ethiopia, and part, parts of Asia. So, uh, as an IPNC advisor, so I kind of knew what kind of things I would expect in a in a low or middle income country. So, uh, part of the project was it developed really, and those conversations. So, so basically, it was no one really knew what I was doing, no one knew what I could do. So, it's a it, it developed uh, with knowing what um, you know what Welsh government's philosophy was, and also the team's view. So it was about really developing it. I think we did that together, and then when in country, it sort it developed as well. Uh, so obviously, it has to be what's what. Uh, your country country organization wants you to do uh, but hope but but they but just uh identifying the you know the evidence for what they kind of suspected about their prescribing so it did appeal to them but really the proof is in some of the actions and what they will hopefully implement sort of going forward uh from uh from some of the highlights of the report it was very, it's quite lengthy but some things are very simple to implement um particularly around documentation and compliance with prescribing so uh i think uh you know that's that that will hopefully be taken forward through um through some of the leads there okay thank you for that amanda i'm conscious of time and i'm sure people are probably starting to think about needing to put the dinner on um lena from hub Cymru africa who's helped facilitate this session for the wales and africa health links network She's just popped an evaluation form on the screen. And I think you can actually do it while you're sitting here. I know when we go to conferences and we're, we're given these bits of paper, we always try and dash out because we want to go home. But if you really could fill this in before you go, it would just help us manage any future sessions. Um, and maybe while you're doing that, I'll take the opportunity of thanking our speakers uh, John and Daniel are available and I'm sure we'll be prepared to help you at any point. But your starting point, I think, is the information on the web, the, the programme link that we sent you. Um, but Amanda and Zora, thank you so much for giving your time. Zora, I'm delighted that the, the technology has, has managed to get us through the, an hour, which is amazing, isn't it? And, and Amanda, with you and your discombobulation, I'm, I'm really pleased that you, 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 you haven't fallen asleep while we've been here. Thank you so much. But I'm sure, I, can I speak on behalf of you both and say if, if anybody has any questions or would like to get in touch, 
it's okay to reach out to you. Um, and we're really keen to see as many applications as possible. It's a limited fund. John doesn't have infinite amounts of money, but we're really keen to make sure that we get a share of healthcare partnerships and whatever we can do in the Wales Africa Health Links Network to facilitate that, that's obviously fantastic and will benefit many others. Please check out um, our website and also Hub Cymru Africa. Um, and if there are any comments that you would like to make, contact Lena um, and she'll pass them on to me. I'm very happy to do so. But Zora and Amanda particularly, thank you very much. And thank you everybody for taking the time um, to come on to this session. Please think about the opportunity. It's rare these opportunities occur. So please grab it with both hands. Um, and hopefully I'll hear from some of you in future sessions about your experience. So thanks very much for being here. Bye.